All right. Well, welcome. Thank you guys for joining us um, as we wrap up the seventh Texas Tech Hispanic Latinx Research and Creativity Symposium. My name is Lucinda Holt. I am the assistant director for the Thomas J. Harris Institute for Hispanic and International Community. Media communication, that is a mouthful. <laughs> so thank you guys uh, for joining us. Uh, like I said, so this panel is from 145 to 315. So we're going to reserve some time at the end of the panel or at the end of the presentations um, you know, for, for questions. So this is political, corporal, and epistemological perspective. Our first presenter is Andrew Gibb, and he is going to be sharing in no wise mark by Suavity or Finesse, Diego de Vargas, and the performance of 17th century New Mexico politics. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that <clears throat> introduction. And let me make sure this. Um, now, should I be, should I be somehow sharing this with people at home or people at home, are you seeing this on your screen or? Mr. Valadares, are you able to see the presentation? Yes, I can see it. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Andy Gibb, and I teach in the School of Theater and Dance, I'm a, I'm a theater historian. Uh, and what I focus on mostly is theater and performance in the North American Far West. Um, and uh, this, this piece today is a little bit uh, uh, more in lines with the sort of performance study stuff I do than the sort of traditional analysis of theater. Um, uh, this is about sort of political performance. So uh, today I'd like to share with you the tale of a contentious transfer of power from one chief executive to another during a moment of social unrest. This story took place just down the road from here some three centuries ago, but the clear parallels with our current uh, political events at the national level admittedly drew is what first drew my attention to this moment. Uh, of course, all events take place within their own specific historical context, and ultimately, this tale tells us much less about the politics of today than it does about those of New Mexico in the 17th century, and about the power struggle between imperial centralization and local creolization that characterized the long history of the Spanish colonial project. With respect to both the present and the historical valences of this story, I argue that in moments when institutional and logocentric authority of the modern state is called into question, the influence of embodied performance as a mode of power's expression increases accordingly. With this analysis, I apply a performance studies lens to a reading of the archived reports, petitions, and decrees that form the basis of tra the traditional uh, historical accounts of the events that I relate. The mise-en-scene or the setting, so to speak, of this particular moment of civic uncertainty is the place now known as New Mexico. Oh. Um, uh, during the establishment, uh, the, or rather the reestablishment of Spanish settler colonialism following the indigenous uprising historians have labeled the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. The three central dramatis personae of this real life drama include Diego de Vargas, the then famed and now infamous, more on that later, Spanish reconqueror of New Mexico, the governor who succeeded and also preceded de Vargas into office, Pedro Rodriguez Cubero, uh, no images of Rodriguez Guerra survived, so he's represented here by his official signature. And the Cabildo of the city of Santa Fe, the municipal council representing local land owning elites. This is not an image of the Santa Fe Cabildo, but rather a painting of a famous 1810 meeting of the Buenos Aires Cabildo. Uh, but it does give you a sense, a visual sense, of the collective nature of the Cabildo in Spanish America. 
This particular, the particular scenes that I've chosen to implot this story are those moments when De Vargas, Rodriguez Guerrero, and Calibre stepped beyond the act of filing paperwork to embody their claims to power through, uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, beyond the act of filing paperwork to embody their claims to power through public performances designed to sway audiences. Those moments include Guerrero's entrance, uh, entrance into Santa Fe, a series of very public hearings and the equally public meeting out of legal punishments. Taken all together, these performances represented an open struggle to determine who would hold power in post Pueblo revolt Spanish New Mexico. The climax and denouement of that power play prefigured the shape that colonial, Spanish colonial authority would take in the Americas in the succeeding centuries and perhaps offered an unsettling prediction of where our own troubled times may be leading us. Sometime before the end of de Vargas's first term in, from 1691 to 1697, during which he led a, the successful uh, and, and rather violent second suppression of local native sovereignty, the so-called reconqueror asked the king to extend his time in office. Though confident of the results of that petition, de Vargas had not filed it in enough time to reach decision makers in Madrid. And thus his appointed successor, Pedro Rodriguez Guerrero, arrived in Santa Fe in July of 1697, long before any official response could come. Members of the city's cabildo, local elites who were not happy with the way de Vargas had gone about reestablishing Spanish authority in New Mexico, arranged a warm welcome for Rubes, uh, Rodriguez Guerrero. Sources indicate that de Vargas, for his part, refused to attend Rodriguez Obrero's installation, performing through his conspicuous absence a public denial of his successor's legitimacy. Several weeks later, de Vargas was still in Santa Fe, awaiting word of his re reappointment. The Cabildo, by now confident that authority was securely in the hands of Rodriguez Obrero, proceeded to file formal charges against the previous governor accusing him of a long list of offenses, including cronyism, misuse of public funds, uh, and the persecution of all who would testify to his misdeeds. Upon review of the charges, Rodriguez Guerrero ordered de Vargas placed under house arrest. In addition, the very public to this very public incarceration of the former governor, Rodriguez Guerrero ordered de Vargas's property auctioned off to repay his financial misappropriations. Amongst the items auctioned were a number of de Vargas's shirts. Prone to showing off his family status and the authority of his office through clothing, um, de Vargas must have found galling the distribution of his beautifully tailored shirts to a populace he considered, quote, very low class, unquote. For their part, many Santa Fecinos must have been happy to appropriate and display the sartorial emblems of de Vargas's insufferable elitism. While Rodriguez Cubero's sentence may have hurt de Vargas's pride, it did little to blunt his ambition. Confined to the house of a supporter, de Vargas played the role of the unfairly accused and confidently informed any visitor, including his barber, of his impending return to power. He even apparently distributed gifts to supporters, perhaps one or two of the shirts that had not been auctioned off of his back. As de Vargas's performance slowly gained traction throughout, throughout 1698, an increasing number of Santa Fe's residents began to speak openly on his behalf. In early 1699, rumors began to reach Santa Fe that de Vargas's request for a second term was being favorably reviewed by the crown. Feeling their control of the narrative slipping, the Cabildo filed additional charges, this time against de Vargas's lieutenant, Antonio Valverde y Cosio, who was then at that time in Madrid pleading the former governor's case. Those accusations were amplified by Rodriguez Guerrero's ordering of public hearings. Later in the year, open support for de Vargas by prominent Santa Vecinos prompted yet more public hearings, this time to accuse de Vargas of fomenting sedition. After hearing testimony against de Vargas from several prominent local elites, Rodriguez Guerrero ordered further restrictions on the activities of his predecessor. Writing materials were denied him. 
No one but family were henceforth allowed to visit him, and all visitors were subject to body searches. Perhaps sensing a weakening of his opponent's position in these seemingly desperate measures, de Vargas refused to step outside of his house when summoned to hear the reading of his newest sentences, an open denial of Rodriguez Guerrero's authority. Once again, publicly repudiated, Rodriguez Rivero responded with the most humiliating punishment he was empowered to give. He had de Vargas placed in leg irons, forcing the new governor to play the part of a criminal on those few occasions, such as attending church when he was free to circulate in the community. If Rodriguez Rivero and the Cabildo's increasingly radical performances were a response to concerns about what might be going on in Mexico City and Madrid, their fears were well founded. In early summer of 1700, word came from the vice regal capital that de Vargas was to be released. On 20 July 1700, after two and a half years of incarceration, de Vargas departed Santa Fe to plead his case before the viceroy in Mexico City. He would return three years later with the aristocratic title of Marquis and the royal designation of Pacificador to take up his second term that he'd long promised or threatened, depending on who his audience was. I don't invoke de Vargas's audience lightly here, as any reading of the struggle between the governors and the cabildo as a performance must take into account its spectators. Historians have long assumed that the actions of the two claimants were intended to sway the opinions of New Mexico's newly resettled colonists. But they are also quick to note that it was an audience of one, King of Spain, who ultimately wrote an ending to the play of de Vargas, Rodriguez Guerrero, and the Cabildo. The complexity of these performances, especially in the cases of Rodriguez Guerrero and the Cabildo, who throughout this period maintained control of the official channels of communication, is that they were conducted with a full awareness of both their local and their imperial audiences. This is perhaps in no case more evident than the multiple public hearings conducted by Rubia Rodriguez Cubero, who would have had the live testimony before the assembled citizenry of Santa Fe recorded for later presentation to the king, the viceroy, and their respective ministers. Those hearings would not only have performed to all audience of Rodriguez's unfitness for leadership, but they would have justified the performative punishments that Rodriguez Cubero needed out. Ultimately, the local performances of all parties proved indecisive due to the fact that the royal audience was the only one recognized by all performers to be the legitimate source of authority. As a result, the attempt of the Creole elites who comprised the Cabildo to exert local power accomplished the opposite end, and New Mexico was drawn all the more tightly into the web of Spanish imperial power. Within a few decades, the Bourbon reforms would further strengthen the hand of the Spanish crown vis-a-vis -vis Creole elites, though those centralizing pressures eventually did the fames of the revolution. But by the time the 19th century rulers of independence came along, the radicalness of New Mexico's elites had been thoroughly tamed. While revolutionary leaders, the likes of Father Hidalgo, performed their defiance with gritos and banners, the elites of Santa Fe watched from the sidelines. One lesson is to be drawn from this history regarding the current state of U.S. politics is perhaps a great one. What kept the leadership struggle of early 18th century New Mexico from devolving into civil chaos was the fact that the performances of the Vargas, Rodriguez Guerrero, and the Cabildo were ultimately aimed at securing the recognition of a single monarchical audience. The political theater witnessed by U.S. citizens today may once have been aimed at a singular audience of elusive, uncommitted voters, but with the rise of talk radio, cable news, and social media, the performances of competing politicians are increasingly directed exclusively toward their own political bases. Instead of a single play showing to an audience gathered together in one theater, we now have two separate casts performing two different shows in two distinct venues. Interestingly, Diego de Vargas has recently suffered yet another, this time posthumous humiliation, Contentious national and local debates about the interpretation of history have led the municipal leadership of modern Santa Fe to negotiate the end to an annual civic pageant, La Entrada, inaugurated in 1911 by town boosters to celebrate the legacy of Spanish colonial New Mexico. These same politicians, fearing civil unrest, 
also ordered a statue of de Vargas removed from the town square. In a historical irony, those Santa Feans of today who most strongly advocate for the continued celebration of de Vargas as a figure of Hispano pride may well be descendants of the Cabildo of 1697 who so despised the real political man. It remains to be seen if the so-called reconqueror will stage yet another comeback. Thank you. Any questions or comments while we move on to our next presentation? We do have a small window when we're transferring over. So any questions or comments will be welcomed at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when was that statue removed? Was that during the other statue removals? From a couple years ago, like actually, I, I, later. I think it happened. Uh, you may know the, the removal of the statue of Juan de Oñate, uh, and that came down because there were protests and someone got shot. Uh, some one of the militiamen who was there to defend the statue shot someone. Um, and I, I think the timing is that that was in Albuquerque. And I think the timing is that then the mayor, whatever Santa Fe said. We don't want that to happen here in Santa Fe, so we better take that statue down. The interesting- um, Was it a couple of years ago or like- Yeah, so that, I, I, I imagine it was 2020. Yeah. I can't remember when the outcomes have happened. The interesting thing that's recently happened that's in the news is that uh, they took the statue down and, um, and, and the politicians say they were under the impression, everyone else seemed to be under the impression that they were taking it down to put it in some city warehouse someplace. But recently, some um, uh, reporter was going about town and looked over a wall and saw the statue in someone's backyard, mm -hmm. which means some like supporter of De Vargas was like, "Fine, take it down, but come put it in my backyard mm -hmm. so we can support it." Uh, and there was there was last I heard, they were sort of investigating how it ended up there and so on and so forth, but I haven't heard any further on it. Very good. Okay, so. Up next, we have Marcus Valadares, and he is going to present on Bodies on the Edge of Survival, Naked Life, Precarious Work, and Necropolitics in Sun, Mad, and Wrath of I believe you are muted. Yes. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? No? Oops. Give me just a minute, please. I'm doing something wrong here. Will do. Okay. Uh, can you see the, the, the image um, I'm sharing? Yes, we can see your presentation. Okay, thank you. So, uh, good afternoon. My name is Marcos Valadares. I'm a graduate student of the Spanish program at Texas Tech. And I will be presenting uh, a work of, uh, of being developing. This presentation aims to reflect on a recurring theme in Chicanx art, the denunciation of the survival status of workers and their families in the southwestern USA as a result of coercive powers and regulatory techniques on which the agroindustrial production process is based. These groups are subjected to adverse labor and living conditions. I analyzed two works that focus on the problem, Sun Mad, a poster by artist Esther Hernandez, and Wrath of Grapes, a documentary by, by Parley and collaborators. The objective is to reflect on how those, uh, how these two works, which explore different facets of the same problem, align to compose a political movement of resistance against forces that seeking only to preserve and stimulate the life of the capitalist machine, lead certain portions of society from the politics of death or necropolitics as defined by Mbembe, 
to a precarious life or a naked life concepts of Judith Butler and Giorgio Gambin, respectively. From the combination of terms that arise from the relationship between capital and biopower, I reflect on the vulnerability of an individual located in an empty space formed by a state that promotes a political, legal, social, and economic exception. I begin the presentation analyzing the poster, uh, Sam Mad, interpreting it as a portrait of Yomo Sasser in his, uh, and his precarious life. After that, I explore the documentary Wrath of Grapes, considering it a testimony of bare labor and bare life under necropolitical forces. Each of them, as we'll see, exploring the technical potential and special features of each format and genre, find the resonance with each other, forming together a strong movement of denunciation and resistance, making Chicken X art a political act that finds its role in subversion. <clears throat> Some ad by Chicken X, Esther Hernandez, presents a critical rereading with political, social, and economic reverberations of the image of the sun made grand's box, revealing what is hidden behind a distorted discourse and exposing the face of California agribusiness. Reconfiguring elements of the image, Hernandez subverts the discourse implemented by California Central Valley Raising Company focusing on what is present in everyday life, what is exposed but because of the intersection of dominant discourses is unseen. What the poster denounces is a perverse architecture that from produ production to consumption exploits a constant state of survival, exposing society at different levels to risk and ultimately to death itself. In other words, Sam Mad is the portrait of Agambas, Agambins Homo Sasser, an individual who's experienced dehumanization in contemporary society and who invisible in the discourse of life and the promotion of health is often exposed to a state of death. In contrast to the idyllic image of a smiling peasant woman with a beautiful basket of green grapes in sun environment that evokes of a healthy lifestyle, Hernandez presents what escapes the gaze because it's part of the hidden zone of the absence of political and civil rights, of social invisibility and the four materialized only in the body of those who live or rather survive the experience of the precariousness of life itself. The image of a woman already lifeless of a skull is the very portrait of the Homo Sasser as conceived by Agamben, that individual inserted in a juridical political structure that as in the concentration camps exploits the absolute inhuman condition, the naked life, which arises when the state of exception becomes the norm. What some ad represents is the worker who survives the consequences of an adverse, inhospitable, and hostile environment that far from promoting quality of life as the product brand proposes is configured as a space destined for death. This is the context in which farm workers who work in the crops find themselves being exposed among other problems to the harmful consequences of the use of pesticide. <clears throat> the artist's poster gives visibility to the situation of vulnerability and exclusion of those who survive in a marginalized area in a space of invisibility, or as Butler defines it, approaching Agamben's ideas of those who live in a precarious life. In other words, the woman's skull is the symbol of those who bought, whose body whose bodies bear the mark of the experience of the precariousness of life, of the harvest workers whose security has been undermined, whose rights have been suspended, and whose basic conditions for a minimal, minimally dignified life have been taken away. That's consequence of an economic system that privileges capital while taking human, human life to the extreme that this woman now represents, death. In this sense, the image helps us to reflect on issues that Butler points out as important within a contemporary process that reinforces the value of some lives to the detriment of others. On the other hand, what Hernandez also denounces, along with the unhealthy working condition of peasants exposed to pesticides, is the impact of the use of the same chemicals on the food of those who consume the fruit of these crops. Pilbart argues that the naked life represented the extreme form in the figure of Homo Sasser, 
applies in other proportions to all of us, extending the conditions of survivor to the way of life in the contemporary society. What that dead woman is carrying is not a basket of green grapes produced naturally, but yellowish grapes covered with chemicals, an image confirmed by the text that highlights the unnatural cultivation and the use of different pesticides. In the sense, <clears throat> what the work uh, reveals is that we are all exposed, some more than others, to adversity of what corrupts the order, of what is not organic, natural, of what escapes the production of life, involving us all also through consumption to a state of survival to death. In congruence um, <clears throat> with Hernandez, uh, Hernandez's work, the documentary Wrath of Grapes denounces the extensive and unrestricted use of pesticide in grape plantations, the harmful of their presence on the people's, on people's lives, and the vulnerability of individuals in the face of supremacy of grape growers. What at first appears to be the struggle of the United Farmer Workers of America Union in search of basic rights and minimal working conditions is actually a struggle that seeks to elucidate a problem that is not limited to the space of a harvest and affects different lives. What the documentary shows us is that all individuals, from workers to consumers, in different levels and spaces of time, are involved in a situation of risk of illness and death. During the documentary, we have access to historical information, political contexts, and scientific data. However, the knowledge that stands out is the experience of those who live the naked life and seek the right to mourn, bearing witness to the situation in which they live, and warning of a risk in which we are all in some way involved. The work begins the, uh, by presenting images of the routine of farm workers, accompanied by a song and a speech that highlight the importance of this work and the recognition of this group as human beings who sacrifice themselves to produce food for society. The previous scene is interrupted by a helicopter spraying pesticide on the plantation, introducing the testimony of women who talk about their experiences, their feelings, and their frailties being witnesses of the danger of the use of pesticides. Between the testimonies, the scene of the helicopter spraying chemicals of the, on the plantation returns, highlighting the relationship between the use of pesticides and the situation of vulnerability of these women and their families. The title, Right of uh, Wrath of Grapes, seems to represent well the environment in which plantation works find themselves, a zone of uncertainty, between political legal rights and economic forces that allows individuals to become objects subject to the maneuvers of capital's power. Based on Agamben's concept of their life, why defines this type of labor, which invests minimizing costs uh, in the productive process and maximizing profits to the detriment of basic human living conditions and security as bare labor? Labor instability and inhuman conditions are guaranteed in different levels, starting from land control by producers and corporation investments in the political sphere to psychological and physical violence, and even mur murdering those who insist on fighting against the status quo in these areas. In this context, any legal political right is controlled in the macro and micro spheres, making labor movements weak and even if ineffective forces against economic power. The atmosphere of fury, violence, and destruction evoked by the title is not limited to the lives of workers, but also to their families and all those who live near the plantations. Everyone is ultimately placed into a context of bare life. Mothers and children seem to witness the impact of pesticides used on their bodies as a result of their families' exposure to pesticides in harvest work especially on pregnant women and their children. We then see the dire consequences of pesticide use on the lives of families living in the California Valley, particularly in the town of McFeller. In this community, most part of the residents do not work in the crops, but are surrounded by plantations. Open quote. In the past two years, 11 children in a six block area who have been striking with cancer, six already died. Uh, close quote. 
California Valley becomes a zone of exception of suspension of rights and legal and protection, where all those placed in disorder try to survive an imminent danger, open quote. We are scared right now, I'm worried. I'm afraid for my other kids, my family, our relatives. We just don't know who it's gonna strike next, close quote. This is a state of exception, which becomes the rule, Agamba calls it a camp, referring to the concentration camps. The situation of families struggling with cancer, illness, and death of children. The constant fear is not an exception, but the rule of a space that, although it's part of the territory of the USA, escapes the promise of the American dream. Open quote. These homes were our dream homes, our piece of the American dream, and it's almost like it's turned into a nightmare and we don't know what's happening here. It's out of control." Close quote. Individuals in these regions live the barbarism of bare life, the dehumanization of the countryside, facing the nightmare of contamination of land, water, food, and their bodies, leaving them with nothing, nothing but the vulnerability and insecurity of being in a constant state of survival. Open quote. People are afraid of what's in their water, afraid to eat in their, uh, their fruit that is grown around them, afraid to let their children play in schools, yards, near fields, close quote. <clears throat> the exposure to danger and the constant vulnerability of these communities are associated with the Pazaratus reflection on the concept of biopower. Coined by Foucault to refer to a power that arises with the aim of stimulating and guaranteeing the life of the social body, Biopower for Lazarato is today distorted and controlled by economic power and focused solely on the political life of capital. What the documentary shows is that despite the impacts caused by the use of pesticide and the innumerable evidence that points out to their harmful effects, agribusiness invests heavily in the use of chemicals, ignores the damage caused to workers and their families, to the inhabitants of the region and the consumers, and influences legislations that interferes with their production. Focused only on their interest, what producers want to stimulate at all costs is the production of their business, even if puts the lives of the population at risk. In the sense, the life they seek to preserve and stimulate is that of the capitalist machine, of the maintenance of power, of economic interest, of the minimization of expenses and the maximization maximization of profits, even if for that they must sacrifice welfare, welfare, health, life. Linked from production to consumption, the work shows that everyone ultimately is placed in a political system of death, or as Mabembe calls it, subjected to powers of necropolitics. Harvest workers are objectified, transformed into commodities, reduced to a force that can be exploited and discarded. In this sense, it matters little to the economic forces that commodify these individuals if they find themselves in a state of extreme, extreme precariousness. The situation in which they find themselves is a warning of the risk of pesticides for society, but, they, but their invisibility, their positions of marginality uh, do not allow them to be seen, nor the system that puts them at risk. Open quote. She, Dr. Marion Moses, is concerned about the warning she sees in the fields and the dangers they pose to consumers. The workers are a kind of canaries, if you will, for consumers out there because the workers are being harmed. Close quote. Workers are exposed to the risks of pesticides, are contaminated, and are susceptible to illness and death. The same chemical also offer risks to consumers who, through consumption, enter a system that inserts everyone into an economy of death, open quote. <clears throat> These are the same residues that are ending up on the food that is being bought in the market and being fed to sick people and infants. Some of the chemicals that are concerned about that to end up as residues, as this uh, carcinogenic, teratogenic, and birth defect causing pesticides that we don't think should be in the American diet, close quote. Throughout the documentary, the presence of helicopters, airplanes, and tractors spraying pesticides on the grape plantation alert us to the extensive use of pesticides. 
The final images reinforce that the danger is imminent and everyone, not only the farm workers, is susceptible to the consequences. The final scene illustrates the path, the grape travel, and with them, the anger and the violence provoked by the pesticide that accompanied them. From the field to people's table, everyone is guided by the power of economic forces to necropolitics. Thank you. Very good. Um, that was some compelling imagery, uh, Mr. Valadares, um, and some thoughts as well. Um, this has all been very good. So while we transition into the next, does anybody have any questions or comments for Mr. Valadares? We'll welcome that at this point. So if nobody has anything, then please let's welcome Dr. Lucy Arellano and Jay Silva Tovar with unapologetically Tijuana, pushing epistemological boundaries through a third liminal space. Can you see that online? Mr. Valadares, are you able to see the presentation? Yeah, I can see it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Well, um, hello, everyone. Um, so we're going to go ahead and talk about um, a topic that both of us um, in what we were doing um, separately, right? So uh, we are sorority sisters and a historically Latina sorority. And one of the one day uh, we decided to go to Panera, and we were talking about my research topic for my doctoral degree. And so as I was kind of talking, we we're doing work, um, and I said, "Yeah, I'm really looking at maybe uh, Chingona identity and how undergraduate Latina students come to kind of claim the Chingona identity." And so Dr. Arellano uh, was like, "Hey, I've actually done some work on this already." let's talk, what are ways that we could collaborate? And so when this opportunity came up, we thought what a wonderful way to present um, some of the things that we've done, the things that I'm exploring um, as I think about my dissertation. Um, I'm in my second year of my doctoral program. So. All right, so today what we'd like to be able to do is complicate this notion of what Chingona means, what it is um, as well. Um, as well as review kind of how we've looked at some theoretical perspectives in our work um, and exploratory research that we'd like to do. Um, and then we'll present a Chingona epistemology and Dr. Arellano has a, um, information on that and really the C-H-I-N-G-O-N-A stands uh, for something. And then at the end, right, Chingona y que, like and so what? Why does this work matter? And why would we look at exploring um, a Chingona epistemology and identity? So we're gonna switch off here. We're gonna keep you awake at least, or <laughs> our half attempt to keep you awake. So I started this work, oh my God, 2017. There was, it was before Chingona was a mainstream term, right? Now it's, you see it in a social media, definitely we see it in articles folks are like repping it and, and embracing that label. At that time, it was barely starting to come into the, into the scene, if you will. And so I started with where did this term come from, right? So it's a very, and I took, and I took it, I entered this work into, this is a very extremely powerful word that my grandma would like smack me with a chunk if I were to say it, but in that re-empowerment and re sort of um, retaking it, to mean something in a very empowering way, I wanted to go back to the, to, to the nascent beginnings of this term. And so 
Again, I'm not a Latino studies expert. I'm not a linguistic person that studies Spanish. And so my, very, my you know, foray is higher education. And so my attempt into what this meant is what I'm very at the cursorily presenting here today. So when looking and diving into what the research says and what the literature says, the origin of the word chingona points to the historical figure of La Malinche. And I found it refreshing to hear that one of the other concurrent presentations right now is presenting on La Malinche. So I have to check out that recording right now. And so it's also known, the, the figure, the image is also known as Malintin, which was an indigenous woman who, who served as a translator between the Spanish conquistadores and various Mixteca tribes, uh, again, pre-colonial or at the point of colonial um, conquest there. She's portrayed as the ultimate traitor in the literature and is the, both the figurative and actual literal birth of Mexico, right? So at this juxtaposition of indigenous and Spanish um, union, if you will, or conflict, or let's problematize it. And uh, Aida Montalo has this really awesome quote. And in speaking about it, she says, all Mexicana Chicana women are potential malinches capable of betrayal if they are not under the watchful eye of patriarchy. Further moving along, the first time that I was able to find the um, Malinche sort of invoked in the literature was with Octavio Paz in 1950, which was then translated in 61. Um, and this was the work called La Malinche and the Labyrinth of Solitude that he has. Um, Alcala, another scholar, uh, fast forward a few years, she says, La Malinche epitomizes women's inherently unreliability through her religious conversion converted, uh, cultural assimilation, political collaboration, and most important, her sexual liaison with the enemy. So the actual physical birth of the country of what we, what we has come to know of Mexico. And in this larger context, we see the patriarchal nationalistic ideology embedded in this history. Finally, La Malinche becomes synonymous with La Vendida and ultimately La Chingara, which literally means the one who was screwed over, excuse my language. Um, while it does seem opportunistic to blame the entire fall of the Aztec empire on the role of a single indigenous you know, woman, uh, critical Chicana scholars view her role quite differently. And so it's exactly in this ability for her to navigate multiple worlds, religious conversion, cultural assimilation, political collaboration, and most importantly, her sexuality that make her dangerous and I, my pun here is, dare I say it, chingona. Um, Alcala again revisits this uh, word of reclaiming and going from chingada to chingona. This is a really, uh, I recommend this work that she um, visits and revisits and re reintroduces us to what La Malinche is. So a note on language. Um, as you can see, the term itself has a problematic history, but in more contemporary terms, chingona is seen as a derogatory term from a few generations ago. My mom even now would smack me if she would hear me say it. Um, but it's a derogatory term because of the root word that it emerges from. And again, this, this concept of the chingada, the malinche, who betrayed Mexico, right, and sold herself and her people to the conquistadores. Um, and is synonymous, again, more contemporary, I apologize language, but this is history <laughs> and, and what we're at today, is synonymous with the word fuck. So chingada means that person who's screwed over, who's fucked over. Um, we see this in putting it in the, you know, we use the word in the sentence. Okay, when we say that la chingada, it says fuck off, it means fuck off or go to hell, like remove yourself from the situation. But when we say the opposite in the male sense, chingon, chingon is not considered an insult. So there's this gender dynamic at play here where when you say something, eso está bien chingon, it actually means something positive, like, hey, that's pretty cool. So there's this dynamic here of the question posits, how can a gender change in a simple name change its meaning inherently? So that's where we're at <laughs> in terms of what we're sharing here today. 
there's a, a bunch more on the paper that's forthcoming. But I will um, switch over to Jane and she's gonna talk a little bit more about how we come to this work from a theoretical lens. Thank you. Um, so when we were discussing our previous work, we talked about, you know, kind of what our theoretical perspectives were in Dr. Arellano's previous work and kind of what I was exploring for my research proposal and how we wanted to enter into the work thinking about Chingona identity and Chingona epistemology. And so one of the common areas that we both saw throughout our work was this idea of theoretical borderlands and being able to create um, this politic born out of, of necessity as well as resistance and what Anzal Dua really calls the frames, right, that are positioned to pur purposely push beyond current epistemological perspectives to create a third liminal space, interrogating the production of knowledge and its values therein. And so when we thought about our theoretical perspectives, there isn't just one space, right, that really captures the essence. And so even just the term Chilona being very nuanced and complex, so too does the theoretical we need to um, think about how we go enter into this work. And so being able to utilize a Chicana feminist epistemology really recognizes and was born out of the feminist movement where it was a black white binary, right? Um, where Chicanas were not represented within the feminist movement. And so this recognizes the multiple and interconnected oppressions that Latinas navigate and their lived experiences creating this third liminal space. And so as we think about um, a theory of the flesh that comes out of the Anzaldúa and Moraga's work. Um, it's really about creating the space to discuss the realities of Latina Chilonas and the liminal spaces they occupy both uh, physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and through ancestral voices. And um, Baca Zin and Zamrana has really looked at, since the Chicana feminist movement, to where we're at today is that we see four areas where we are seeing Chicana contributions to intersectional scholarship uh, based off of borders, right? And so again, as we think about liminal spaces, that also means borders at the different intersections and what does that mean? Race, class, gender, sexuality, and citizenship. As we think about identity, what is the essence of being and knowing? And then institutional in equalities and then the praxis, right? How are we bridging, crossing, and resisting certain spaces that Latinas navigate? And through this um, project and kind of looking at my own research, it's thinking about a Chingona, Chingona knowledge and agency conceptual framework. And so really being able to frame the um, accounts for uh, oppression at the various intersections of an individualistic as well as a collective Latina identity and the meaning of Chingona, right? So it's not just an individualistic, but we think about our own meanings and ways of being and even presenting today, right, as a collective, um, that it's not you individually going through, but really how do we capture the collective essence of what Chingona really is, means for individuals. Um, and so being able to do that requires that we explore through the lens of theory of the flesh um, and really taking that analysis, looking at the physical realities, the mind, spiritual, and the relationships uh, amongst the community of Latina, and then viewing oppression as a part of identity development, right, that can move and shift in multiple directions. There isn't one linear way of being, but that there can be multiple sites of how we navigate our lived experiences. And then being able to also do that through a decolonial feminist theory. And so really thinking about self-defining practices where a epistemic shifts uh, can move in multiple directions at the same time, right? So even nuancing how we think about linear progressions of how somebody comes into a uh, being. Um, and that really is important for us as we think about this work in reclaiming the indigenous um, aspect of the new work she wanna, right? Um, and then being able to do that through testimonials. And so um, a couple of scholars really being able to have those shared experiences uh, where we're creating an inner and a collective healing possibilities through sharing our testimonials for creating that space and being represented in the literature and community as well as acts of resistance um, and being able to develop agency to resist um, oppressive, westernized, patriarchal, and epistemological frameworks. Um, and then Fear of the Flesh really represents a tool 
to have Athena share our embodied experience as well as harming our reality. And so um, in the prior presentation, right, we talk about bodies as sites of being and knowing as well as trauma and pain. Um, it's, they're also sites for resistance. Um, it's also a call to action um, to not only listen, but have solidarity and liberation and our collective healing. Um, and then being able to critique the oppressive structures um, that have placed a resistance identity of a Chibona uh, knowledge and agency. So as we think about how to view the work and the analysis through these lens, it's looking at being able to take the Chicana feminist epistemology um, and conceptualizing that through theory of the flesh and testimonials, which creates a theorized bridge um, towards a third space that can interrogate Chingona knowledge and agency through the third theoretical space that allows for a deeper um, meaning of a Chingona identity that can be formed and offer a critical lens to distress oppressive educational institutions, as well as being able to have identity constructed without a constructive lens, um, but that we instead recognize the oppressive existence um, with identity without disrupting the oppressive shapes of identity. And um, we look at identity and meaning making seen as a filter and how an individual navigates the world. Um, so through a Chicana Latina feminist perspective, we call for this third liminal space and being able to navigate the identity and meaning making, but instead serve as a Latina uh, Chicana collective identity through that third liminal space. Um, so we are proposing, right, um, that we push against the normative theoretical and methodological ways of defining the lived experience of the other, um, where Latina narratives are centered through an embodied experience. Slow down, we have some time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so when we uh, uh, came to this conversation, it was funny, I'll come back to the story that Jay presented. Uh, she had no idea that I've been working on this. And so it was pretty serendipitous that we've known each other for a year. Like, Years. Yeah, before prior. It, and so when she's mentioned just, what was it, like a month ago, two months yeah. ago? Literally, <laughs> hey, what is your new topic? And she's like, oh, I'm thinking about Chingona stuff. And I'm like, you know, there's something in my back pocket I'm going to share with you at a later point, not now, <laughs> not to overwhelm you. But it was absolutely amazing that someone else has started thinking about this in a more concrete way um, and, a, and in a very academic space that will allow that for her via her dissertation. So, I started, like I mentioned, back to the, I started doing this work and delving into it and allowing myself to delve into it back in 2017 when there was a uh, very limited uh, anything out there on it. And it was accepted into ARA, so that's my citation. I haven't found a permanent journal article home yet. I'm still shopping, you know, posada in it out till someone gives it a home. Uh, but it was presented in 2019 at ARA, and it was, it was, people loved it. So it's more of a challenge now to, to in the most of what the peer review process is. So in this work, I thought about what epistemolog epistemological uh, space means and the creation of knowledge and how knowledge is valued. And so I wanted to impose this concept of what a chingona is in the multiple facets of, of the identity of what a chingona is and give it the legitimacy and call it this epistemological um, foundation, if you will. And so, what I'm, what I'm presenting here is a new framework. And so the framework, as I conceptualized it, is presented from a cultural standpoint that is located at the intersection of race, ethnicity, gender, SES, sexuality, and within the historical and contemporary context of oppression and resistance. So there's a lot of things that are at play here at once that are rarely considered in any kind of literature, let alone higher ed from, from where we're, our positionality is. So it was a new Chigona epistemology back then. <laughs> and again, it still kind of is because it's not uh, been published yet. But I purposely created this, um, and this goes back to our, our Greek roots of Latinx sorority. Um, we, we wanted meaning out of acronyms. And so I purposely created the eight different sections that I'm arguing that compose 
this chi or epistemology based on, you know, the first words, first letters of, of each of the chi or um, first letters. So we're gonna, I'm going to walk through again sometime and talk about what I would argue is both a part of the theoretical conceptual framework of, of a Chingona epistemology, but also a real life example, right? So the first concept of what I'm arguing is not pretending that this is new, right? So their foundations of where this thought and where this um, framing has come from is from Chingona feminist thought and epistemology as Jake has just presented. Uh, my argument to further this work is to say that a Chingona does not have to be a Chicana. Right, so it's a larger Latinx, Latina even, dare I say, let me, let me correct myself, a Latina perspective that is at the intersection of the multiple identities that I just mentioned earlier. The second element is her story. It's even weird to say it out loud. <laughs> her story. Knowing your her story is vital to being a chingona. So again, recognizing the problematics of what is in the written word Right, you presented something from the 15th, 1500s. What was it from the other side of what was going on in that space? We know the written part, but what was the other side of the unwritten part of history? And so from a, a gendered perspective, what is the female um, perspective that is not written in the formal written history? There's this concept of intersectionality and I will not go through the multiple <laughs> lists here, but it's navigating these multiple spaces simultaneously in an intersectional way and still honoring all of what that individual sort of possesses. The Nepantleras come from the term Nepantla from Gloria Antaldua, which is a Nahuatl term, which means in the middle of it. And Nepantla is tierra desconocida, which translates loosely to unknown territory what Anzaldúa posited. And I argue that perhaps the space of Nepantla is the only conducive space where Chingonas can renegotiate these multi-sectional and intersectional identities and thrive because there is no formal space in mainstream anything <laughs> that would embrace the multi-dimensionality, intersectionality of our identities. Um, the next G is a Guerrera or true translated as being a warrior. Um, Jimona is willing to fight tirelessly for what they believe in. And sometimes we're mislabeled as cabezona uh, or, or as being stubborn. And Sandua reminds us that these scholar warriors, we need to recognize alternate forms of knowledge and recognize alternate forms of knowledge that we bring to the table and engage in the spiritual activism within our body, mind, spirit. One of the gifts that COVID has given us is allow that space to think more purposely about our wellness. And I appreciate that sort of invoking of, of a luminary such as Jordan and work in, in this process. The O is for outspoken. Chingonas call out multiple forms of oppression. Um, and this is from Sandra Cisneros, one of the interviews I found when I was doing a document analysis for this. She says, a chingona also has to be a, has to be a little bit of a cabrona. She has to have a little cabrona edge that won't take crap from anyone. The N is for navigation. So due to the many challenges that, that you want to face in their day-to-day -day lived lives, they become ex experts at navigating multiple terrains. So Chingonas also seek nourishment through connecting with other Chingonas at conferences, such as this one and other symposiums that provide the space to de develop deeper conversations among like-minded mujeres in order to navigate these hostile environments and to be able to function in our other roles because we don't have these empowering spaces available to us <laughs> every day, particularly at, 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 at PWIs, at primarily white institutions. And the last thing I argue is advocacy. So the core of a Chingona epistemology is the activist orientation and that doing for others. Um, we build agency and advocacy for the purpose of following a larger social justice agenda, and we also prioritize the empowerment of our community. And I'll invite Jake to close us out. So as we were talking through this presentation, like 
why would anybody care? She's on AK, right? Like, so why does this matter? And so we started really thinking about this work, our work, and not only uh, self-proclaimed Chicanas, right? Or Chicanas is really understanding how at Texas Tech, especially as a Hispanic serving institution, this allows for an intentional review of our policies as well as our intentional practices, especially as we think about Latinas navigating um, the higher education space and the interactions they're having on a day-to-day -day basis as sites of resistance, um, but also as ways for us as a collective institution to think about what are those oppressive policies and practices that we have in plan, how can we shift and shape those to allow chingonas to navigate through Nepantla and being able to not have the harms perpetuated as an institution. We also think about, right, what are empowering ways of navigating school, academia, work, and leadership roles, um, you know, as a, a Latina um, assistant vice president, right, I'm one of three at the institution, right? And so the different spaces that I navigate as a leader um, was really what kind of made me think about how did I get here and how do I use Chingona to do this? But then also this started to develop when I was in my undergrad, right? And what were the things that I was resisting um, in order to persist and graduate and be a doctoral student, right? And then it also complicates notions of Latinidad um, within our own community, right? Of wow, how we think about patriarchy, right? Masculinity and um, even how we navigate, right? Amongst our own communities and who's considered, you know, quote unquote, good Latina, right? Um, similar story is, you know, when I told my husband kind of what I was thinking, he's like, you can't ever tell my mom. <laughs> like, don't ever say that word in front of her. And thinking about, right, for him, it's like, well, why do you have to use Chingona? And so it starts to create this own educational space where um, our partners, our friends, um, and our colleagues can start to represent and create space where we can be our authentic selves. Um, so. I just noticed you and I are matching. We got the black shirt on <laughs> to the dark lipstick. So. All right, well, thank you. So um, right now we have a few minutes left. Uh, are there any questions for anyone who presented? Okay. Yes. I have a question for uh, Dr. Arellano and Ms. Um, and. I, I'm sure you addressed this in your presentation. I just wasn't uh, paying close enough attention. Um, but uh, maybe if you could t uh, tell me again, at least, um, the connection that you see uh, between, um, uh, you were talking about Chigona as an embodied knowledge, but then you were also talking about testimonials as a, and my experience with testimonials is it's usually just a, it's a written record, right? Um, so, um, are these somehow embodied testimonials or do they interact with the embodied in some way? I mean, are you actually taking down people's testimonials or writing them out or? Yeah, one of the things that I proposed, again, this was like a, a class project of like, you need to start thinking about your dissertation. Um, but that's one of the things of like the, the, not only the written, but the spoken and creating that space for um, Chigones to tell, right? And so when we think about the oral history and oral storytelling, again, paying honor to indigenous ways of being and knowing of how histories are passed along um, by voice and through family stories. Um, one of the things that I was also looking at is being able to use um, photo elicitation um, for participants to then look at, um, you know, maybe there aren't words um, to either describe or stories to tell, but instead, um, <clears throat> What are things, right? When do you feel chingona, right? And what does that mean? And so then starting to look at some um, imagery that would represent what it means to be chingona or how um, sometimes language and words are hard to come through of that embodiment and that emb embodied knowledge. I mean, yeah, when we presented this, we presented this at um, an, uh, the Association, uh, the American Association of Hispanics in Higher Education two years ago or before the pandemic, and we had a workshop and we were asking folks in written format as a data collection, because that was one of the 
R and R's from the submission that I did is you don't have any data, go collect some data. And so purposely we collected what do you, how do you define chingona and what are the characteristics of a chingona? And a lot of what they shared was one word things, but it was in the sharing orally, right? Like they wouldn't write that down just because that feels very awkward for, for most of the participants that were in the room as Latinx, as Latina as my majority, there were a couple of, of males in the room, uh, but it was a predominantly Latina audience and they wouldn't have a space or wouldn't feel safe enough to share what they shared in, in that very you know, communal community building space. And so we also are very aware of the consejos that we give to each other. And then, and then there's basically this is called paquetito advice that we, we then support. Um, so we also honor the oral and and comadre kind of atmosphere that was created in that space and also honor that as well. So it's not only written but in multiple formats. Um, we also created a poem in that space, right? Like there's a lot of other ways to engage in the testimonial part of it as a method. And in terms of the data check on the art, would you would you be recording this like uh, um, either audio or visual or both? Mm -hmm. um, would that would the process of recording be you know get in the way of this kind of sharing that you're talking about? Or are you thinking that these testimonies would be taken down how we're taking them? Collectively, so that you're instead of you know usually testimonials, you know just consider write about your experience, right? I mean, how how what are the sort of um, you know what are, what are the mechanics of how you plan to like when when you have the dissertation, what will the data look like? Yeah, I've um, started to explore um, you know individual interviews, but then group um, being able to have that collective because I think. When you think about testimonials, like testimonies translated to English, it, there's a disconnection culturally, right? And what Dr. Arellano is saying, right, is like these ways of communicating um, that goes beyond just a written statement. And, and that's the difference is that through testimonials, right, it's not just a statement of who I am, my shared experience, but then it's also the analysis of the things and the themes that are coming out of those testimonies, right? And being able to look across um, the community. What are the things that are coming up? Um, maybe there are different and varied experiences, but then also looking at the oppressive structures um, and paying special attention to oppression and patriarchy, but then those acts and forms of resistance. And so what is coming through um, whether it is individual interviews or group um, kind of like charlas or, you know, sessions, being able to do that through there. And then that's where I think for me, um, because of late, there is a lot of movement as we think about, you know, chingona identity and what it means. So like my sticker, right? <laughs> a chingona state of mind, um, that there are these visual representations, um, ways of navigating, right? Like I wore my hoops today. Some other folks who are there who say, right, is that we have these embodied ways of navigating spaces through resistance without having to say we're resisting in this space. Get an IRB for probably yes. <laughs> well, there's also the difference, right, of, of of gathering data for the sake of a study versus just being in space and 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 purging, if you will, or 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 airing. One of the cool things about that conference that I'm talking about is that we don't have to explain a lot because folks in the room are Latinx themselves and so they understand the lived experience. And it's just to be in communion with each other to, to say, I see you, I understand you, I validate your experience because I navigate a hostile work environment every single day. And I come here to, to gas myself up because I know that there's others and it's higher ed, right? So there's a lot of other professors and graduate students around the country who are going through the same thing I am without the luxury of seeing ourselves in that space and just being in communion with each other is is empowering, let alone once we start talking, right? That's just get it to another level. So it's beyond just data collection and data collection for study, but it's more the importance of what that space and and creating those spaces in an academic conference also what that means. Um, any other questions or thoughts or comments for any of our presenters today? 
I did want to um, thank um, Mr. Valadares. Um, I think some of the things that came out as um, you were speaking were, um, you know, that embodied right experience in, in the body. And um, some of the things that, you know, I was thinking about is you did talk about like the children experience, but to think about bodies and wombs. And so for maybe the mothers that have not yet, um, you know, been able to bear children or the impact of potentially not being able to bear children because of, you know, pesticides. I also think it made me just think about, you know, um, genocide and how that is, you know, kind of a, a capitalistic form of genocide. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, this, this I, yeah, okay. Guys, I think this is, is the idea, is a, an idea of uh, genocide, this like population that is undergoing uh, different sorts of uh, exploitation and being left like to death, right? Yeah, for me, um, I will say, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, very similar to concentration camps and not only was that, you know, very reminiscent for me of, you know, concentration camps, but I also couldn't help but think of uh, what were they called, the mercury women, the women who were directly with mercury and they were eventually poisoned um, again during that World War II time period. So, you know, we, we've seen this, you know, throughout history um, and it's just, you know, unfortunately some segments fall prey to these predatory practices more than others. So um, thank you for, for making that connection and presenting it to us as well. Um, any other thoughts or comments? I'll make one comment in terms of with, with in terms of market studies is that there's this perception that if you get food, fruits, or anything that's produced organically, they don't use pesticides. Well, many of these farms where they have these, you know, growing these fruits and vegetables in the San Joaquin Valley they themselves may not be using it but the farm next door is and so when you have the planes coming in with the pesticides and the water that drains i mean that all has like collateral damage to these organic uh farms or restaurants i mean farms and that, that do grow what they claim to be organic with no pesticides when in reality they're also being affected by these other uh, uh farms that do use it you know i have to talk to to somebody who 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 would say that look we have all these farms using pesticides then you have all these farms that don't use pesticides and they sell their products to places to businesses who then sell it to 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 the customers believing that there's the, no pesticides used but in reality because they're surrounded by farms that do use pesticides and then the waters that they spray the water gets into all these different farms right and so this there's this false narrative of what is being used or not used is, is it's almost a fallacy that very few folks talk about right and the, and the other thing you know the the the, the uh, uh, bio modified fruits and vegetables in terms of what is perceived to be a ripe food and so my colleague was saying you know, has a phd from uc, UC davis said you know, some of these ruby red fruits are not supposed to be that ruby red. Some of these apples are not supposed to be that red, but they're genetically modified because of the perception of what customers want, right? And so that's one of the things I'll take into account when, when talking about this, not just these, 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 these agricultural spaces that use pesticides, but it's also these agricultural spaces that say they don't, when in reality, they know they're being affected by those that do. Yeah, in a way we're, we're all involved like in different uh, levels to the system, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because if, 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 if it's, if we as customers knew or know, I mean, we, we turn a blind eye to it. I mean, look mm -hmm. at the fires in California a few years ago when everybody was saying, stay indoors, don't go outside and work uh, because of all the smoke in the air. Yet you see pictures of farm workers in the fields with all the smoke and fire behind them. Right. And we as consumers of, of this fruits and vegetables are like, well, that's the price these folks have to pay for me to be able to buy a head of lettuce for 99 cents. Mm -hmm. right? and again, it's a hot, at what point do we, we look and reflect on how our behavior in terms of purchasing perpetuates 
uh, the, the conditions that these, these folks are, who we say we want to advocate for, in reality, we're just perpetuating and making things worse. Yeah, the idea is that uh, uh, like these uh, um, camps, uh, like uh, I, I try to compare, they uh, they appear like in 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 societies like in in, in, in this contemporary society, and uh, it's strange, but because we're living different lives and we don't. Uh, uh, um, uh, we either don't see them because they are marginalized or uh, we just pretend that they don't exist, right? Ignorance is bliss, as the saying goes. Mm -hmm. Also, Julie, uh, you know, when you were mentioning that, I was thinking about, you know, how if you go to a farmer's market, the produce is so much different from the produce at Sam. When you buy in bulk, everything just looks so different and it lasts longer. You know, I can buy a bag of apples from Sam's and it'll last for a very long time. And also you mentioned organic farms next to these other farms that use pesticides. What a lot of people don't know is sometimes even in transportation, they're transported in the same truck. Right. And so, you know, that's, you know, we claim to be advocating for these folks, but we, as consumers, we really need to pay more attention how we consume it, how much we consume it. So very good. All right, any other thoughts or comments? Yeah, I have a question for Dr. Gibb. Uh, one of your images that stayed with me, I'm a visual person, so one of the images that stayed with me um, is, is you mentioned that the garbs that one of the folks you were presenting with that the local community was trying to make fun of the way that that individual was dressed and try to mimic it. it am I misremembering or misunderstanding? I'm not curious what that looked like. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that was just conjecture on my part. That, that what's the, what we know is that he had his shirts auctioned off. So if you're going to have an auction, someone's going to buy them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and here's here's this guy who no one likes because he's walking around saying you're a bunch of low crass scum and I'm Mr. Man and look at my shirts. And then suddenly he gets thrown in jail and his shirt goes up for auction. I can't imagine someone's not going to want to buy that shirt and then like wear that shirt around. Yeah. Like who's got the shirt? My shirt now. But that's there's no there's no historical account of people doing anything with those particular shirts. Um, but they, they are mentioned um, along with other things. For instance, uh, 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 there were two um, African Americans enslaved to the to the governor, and when his when his when his um, uh, possessions were auctioned, that included the unfree labor of those two people. So <clears throat> probably not quite as fun or funny experience for them to be bought because, you know, if, if someone were purchasing a person from you and I don't like you, I might tend to, you know, smack that person around a lot more simply because I don't like you, right? So that wouldn't be quite as funny as the shirts. That's, that's why I stuck with, stuck with the shirts when I wanted to do my conjecturing because I could imagine that being somewhat funny, but not the other things. Any other questions? And so when you were mentioning the performance of that, we most were more so noting about how he would display his wealth or so much like the punishment, because you mentioned that during the punishment with the shackles, he wasn't allowed to So wear I was mentioning the auction of his stuff as a performance in and of itself. Okay. This, this guy thinks he's so great, but you 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 told me that he he actually misused your funds and everything like that. So we're gonna throw him in jail and we're gonna auction off all his stuff. Uh, so that's one punishment. Uh, another punishment is I'm gonna put you in leg irons and make you walk around and look like a criminal, right? Yeah. Uh, and then on and then on the other side of the spectrum, De Vargas is doing performances of his own 
he's there in his house and people are coming to visit him and he's saying, oh, I just heard from the king the other day. Any minute now, I'm going to be in charge here. Barber, come cut my hair. I got to look good when I'm going to take over again, right? So both of these guys in the Cabildo, the, the town councils, they're all sort of performing these things, trying to get everyone to believe that they are the center of power. And do their own presentation of image. Right, right. Yeah, I'll just need a clarification because since I was so unfamiliar with it, I needed to mm -hmm. grasp it better. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Anything else? Well, uh, what time is it? Three minutes. Oh. Okay, so we are, we fall five minutes short. Um, so thank you guys very much uh, for your wonderful presentations. It was all very enlightening. And it was cool, even though, you know, there was something different brought to the table. It was cool to see the connection uh, being made through a historical context as well as an artistic one. So uh, thank you all very much. And this concludes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.